Raising taxes provides more money for the state, or does it? Today we're going to look at the effect of raising or lowering your taxation rate, and how in reality, a lot of the time, decreasing your taxation rate increases the amount of tax coming in. I promise you I haven't gone insane, and I am going to explain exactly what I'm talking about, so let's dive in. Victoria 3 has a deep and complicated economic simulation at the heart of this game. This simulation, however, does not function exactly like the real world, it is of course a simulation. But we can attempt to understand the economic loop at play. To demonstrate my point, I'm going to start playing the game as Great Britain, the number one power in the world in 1836. If we go over to our budget panel, we get a whole host of options that allow us to increase the revenue of our state and decrease our national expenses. We're going to look specifically at that revenue side and what effect it can have. You see, I've seen quite a bit of misinformation out there about what effect it will have on your nation if you change the tax rate up or down, or change the spending on government and military wages. You see, the economic system in Victoria is actually a little bit complicated, so doing something like raising taxes whilst in isolation will immediately increase your tax revenue here, the tooltip tells us by £34,000 per month, in reality it's actually a little bit more complicated. All of this starts in the politics tab with our laws. You see there are different ways of taxing our population in the game. At the lowest and most basic level we have consumption taxes. Those are things like VAT, value added tax, added to a product which is sold in your market. Next up from that we have land-based taxation. This includes some consumption tax still, but now includes some land tax. This is a levy on all of the peasants living on land in your nation, and a very low income tax rate. As you can see, as we progress down this track, we have more and more modern taxation laws. With per capita taxation rate, we have that land tax, we have a slightly higher income tax again, we still have consumption tax, and now we have a per capita tax, which is known as, more colloquially, a poll tax. This is a tax levy against every pop or every person in your nation at a flat rate. Proportional taxation does away with the poll tax and the land tax, and instead, it increases income tax and instead adds this new dividends tax. A dividends tax is, as you might have guessed, a tax on dividends. Dividends are only paid to owner class pops, which means in most systems that is your capitalist or aristocratic class. If you go down the full communist class that can change a little bit, but that is who we're talking about here. Finally, graduated tax simply changes those rates around a bit, reducing income tax and massively increasing dividend tax. Apparently this is quite a bit fairer if you think it's fairer to tax the capitalist classes more. So with that out of the way, we know that by reducing our taxation level here, what we're actually going to be doing is reducing the land tax, per capita or poll tax, income tax and consumption tax. On top of that, we can choose exactly what we're charging VAT or consumption tax on by adding those things in the consumption taxes. Each consumption tax has a cost in authority, as an authoritative government must decide, that's it people, we're going to be charging you for all of your furniture. And the more luxurious the item, generally speaking, the lower the authority cost to add it in. And if you're enjoying this video, please, tax that like button. My entire hypothesis and I'm going to call it our hypothesis because I would say it's not entirely proven, is that by lowering our taxes, we are actually going to be increasing the amount of money we are getting in tax revenue in the long term. This won't be an immediate thing, we're looking at this from the long term perspective, and when I say long term, I actually only mean a year or two of in-game time. You see, all of this taxation, it's not just an arbitrary thing, this is happening to actual people in your nation. If we go to the population tab, we can see a detailed list of all of the population broken down into different groups which share the same culture, religion, location and occupation. By selecting one of these groups, we can see the standard of living of that group, the population of that group and how much is growing in terms of yearly births and deaths, how many are part of the workforce, how many are dependents, and then most importantly here, what the net income is of that group. You see, everyone will be making money in your nation. This is an economic game. So any pop or any person will be making income through things like wages, some dependent wages, and if they are part of the owning classes here, like these very wealthy 
capitalists. They will be getting a lot of money through dividends as well. Dividends in this case is this additional weekly balance of £1,830, which is being paid out to the owners, 500 specific capitalists. We could change this to government run, which would mean that instead of being paid to the capitalists, it's now paid to the bureaucrats, which means that actually even if it's government run, you and your government will never directly be earning any money from this weekly balance. All of this income is offset by the expenses of a specific pop. Their expenses start off with all of their taxes. In this case, we have consumption taxes, per capita or poll taxes, and finally income taxes. As yet, we have no actual dividends taxes in this nation, so we won't levy anything from that. After those taxes have been deducted, the pop then purchases items from its needs. The needs a pop has is directly related to their standard of living. So pops with lower standards of living generally buy less and less valuable goods from the market. You see, if we look at something like furniture here, we can see that pops between wealth levels 5 and 14 will use this as a crude item towards their crude item needs. And between levels 10 and 44, this will be a household item need. Conversely, if we look at something like luxury furniture, this is on the other hand a luxury need from wealth levels 15 to 99. Wealth and standard of living are in fact the same thing. And you see what a pop will do if they have a net surplus income is they will increase their standard of living and they will decide to buy more goods and specifically more expensive goods as well. Over time, its standard of living will increase, meaning the amount of money it's, that it's spent on needs will go up higher and higher and higher. Now, why is this important? Why am I going on about the pop's needs? Well, the basis for your entire economy, generally speaking, is pop consumption. At the end of the day, anything created in your nation will be sold either locally or abroad to be consumed by a pop. This is after all the way capitalism works. So if we decrease the amount of taxes on the pops in our nation, let's say I want to put taxes all the way down here to our very low taxes, immediately we will get a bit of a deficit here because our national re revenue has been dramatically reduced instantaneously as the percentage tax rates have gone down. What it's going to do instantaneously is reduce the tax burden on these pops so they will actually have more money to spend and therefore increase their standard of living and then increase their consumption. As you can see, I've let the month tick over now. They've gone from having an excess net income of 250 pounds a week up to a thousand pounds. So if I let the time tick over a little bit further, that will increase their standard of living. As you can see, we've now, after some time, gone up to the middling standard of living. You see, it is not instantaneous. When a pop gets extra money in their back pocket, they won't immediately go out and spend it. They do tend to wait for some time or basically accumulate the wealth until they feel comfortable enough, they have enough money in their bank account, if these primitive people even have bank accounts, to go out and then spend it on more luxurious, more lavish things like meat or possibly fancy furniture. But this is actually going to have another effect overall, which is that we're going to be seeing some inflation happening within the nation. Yes, currency inflation does not happen in Victoria 3, but actual inflation is absolutely something we can see. As you'll notice here, this pot pays an average of plus 3.7% compared to the base price for their needs. And this has increased recently over time, specifically since we have reduced the tax rate. Why is that happening? Well, as we increase everyone's standard of living, their consumption increases, meaning we get more and more buy orders from the market. But that will do nothing to the total supply in our market as we must build more buildings in order to create more supply. And the overall balance here means we will end up having a net increase in the price of goods in our market. Groceries here, for example, have gone up quite a bit compared to where they were in market price right at the start of this game almost a year ago in 1936. And this is because there are now more pops in our nation trying to buy groceries than there were before because they've got more money in their back pocket because I've reduced the taxes. All right, so far, all of this seems like it doesn't really necessarily matter. So what that I've increased the standard of living of pops? So what that I've increased the price of the goods, or at least I've increased the demand for the goods, which has caused a knock-on increase in price. 
Here we have the grocery manufacturer in Leinster, which is producing groceries for our nation. The profitability of any industry which is producing an output of good will be going up, increasing the amount of money generated for the owning classes, but also because the standard of living is increasing for the population working the jobs in this factory. Yes, the workforce of this factory has gone up. For instance, here the machinist has gone up from 23 to 24 based on our actions. Well, actually, wages then go up as well. As standard of living and profits increase, people do tend to expect to earn more money. Here I've jumped back in time right to the start of the game one year before in 1836, and we can see that the average annual wage in this factory was almost one pound less. So by reducing taxes, the system that ends up happening in Victoria 3, which I have to say is different. The economic system here is different to some of the economic models we have for the real world. I just want to say this isn't an endorsement for overall tax reduction, but within Victoria 3, reducing taxes increases the amount of money that the population in your nation have, which increases the standard of living, which then means they will buy more things, which increases the profits of all of the factories, which then means that they have more money to pay their workers better. So overall, the health and economic state of your nation will increase. To prove that, I have taken the same game I have started in 1936, I have set one to have very low taxes, and I have tried with another to have very high taxes and played for three in-game years. I have changed nothing else. I have also tried to build the same buildings in the same order at the same time, which will be an additional railway here in Lancashire, five more tooling workshops in Yorkshire, and beginning the construction of 10 more iron mines in Lancashire, just to try to stabilize the prices of iron and tools because they are rather high in, our, in this nation. And these are also generally resources that are not actually consumed by pops. So this increase in the standard of living of your pops will not increase the prices of these raw materials, although it will reduce the profit of those industries, as those industries will now probably have to pay higher wages. But what it will do overall is make the people in your nation richer, they will have higher wages, and therefore, if we bring our tax rate back here to the medium taxes, we will have a larger amount of money. Here we are halfway through our experiment. The GDP of this nation is currently 63 million pounds, I have just started building some food industries in Leinster, otherwise I haven't built anything in my nation. Here is my queued up construction queue as I mentioned, and I'm now, after 18 months, going to switch over from high taxes all the way up to very high taxes. I will be probably topping out my gold reserves at the absolute maximum right at the top there, but that won't be too much of an issue. On the other hand, I'm now 18 months in, we have a GDP of 64.2 million, and we are at 15.1 standard of living. So the GDP of this nation is higher, the standard of living is higher, and the tax rate is lower. Yes, I don't have as much in the way of gold reserves. Yes, I am losing money in terms of spending my gold reserves, but I am spending those gold reserves as a direct injection of wealth into the nation itself. I am investing in my nation to boost the overall GDP of the nation and increase the quality of life for every person living there. I am now going to go to the lowest taxation level and run a very hefty deficit as we then move towards January 1939. What do you think the difference will be in January 1939 when I bring my taxation back to medium taxes? Will I have the same amount of money being generated as, a, as high taxation and low taxation? And will I have the same GDP? Let me know your prediction down in the comments before I do jump in and show you exactly what the difference is. Here we are in January 1st, 1939. We're currently making a balance of 84,000 pounds per week. We've completely filled out our gold reserves to the point actually where we're starting to get some diminishing returns by adding additional gold. Not much at the moment, but around 15 to 20% losses. So that is something to worry about. It's not fantastic. When we bring our tax rate back to medium taxes here, we're now making 29,800 pounds. I'll also show you exactly what the market has been doing as well, but let's first look at what the low taxation model is. All right, here we are in the low taxation model. We actually have a slightly lower GDP. Now, I believe this is, and I've done this test a couple of times, I believe this is because I've chosen the British market to use. You see, the British market has the unique situation that it is a very global market, and 
things can happen that will affect the economy of the UK based on the decisions of the AI. If they change the prices of things that we're producing, and if we're producing a lot of it, if they decrease that price, that will decrease our overall GDP. So I believe this GDP change is down to the market forces at work, not the individual specifics of this model. However, we have a higher standard of living. And if I move our tax rate here back to the medium, we're now making 43,000 pounds per week. Ah! Oh, wow! That's an additional £10,000 net that we were not making in the high taxation model. So just to prove exactly what I'm talking about here with consumption, let's look at the consumption for basic and luxury resources from the low tax and high tax rate policies. As you can see, the number of buy orders across the board for the high tax rate is lower and therefore the price of all of those goods is lower as well. Whereas with low tax rate, because consumption is higher and we haven't increased the supply, we have now seen inflation. This does mean though that by decreasing taxes, we cannot get a rampant infinite growth model happening because eventually the economy will rebalance. What you want to do is make sure that you use all of that fantastic investment pool cash you've got on hand to go out and build as many additional industries as your nation needs to increase the supply and thus prevent all of that extra inflation from happening. If you can do that, the standard of living of your pops will then continue to increase. And that's basically what you're going to be wanting to do in Victoria. Build more buildings, produce more things, increase the standard of living of your pops, who can then go out and buy more things from all of those extra buildings you have made. You need to think about the taxes here as something like uh, as something like a dam, basically. Increasing taxes, yes, you're going to get more money into the gold reserves, but by doing that, you're extracting money directly from your economy and the engine of your nation will be sputtering, it will be slowing down, you'll be choking it. So over a long enough period of time, increasing your taxes will decrease the overall tax revenue of your nation. On the flip side of this, decreasing taxes is like letting the floodgates open and allowing more money to flow through your nation. You're supercharging the engine of the economy and over a long enough period of time, by increasing the wealth and the wages of everyone living in your nation, that means that your overall tax income will be higher. Yes, the percentages here are lower, but the amount of money you'll be making from your population because you'll have a bigger economy and everyone will be earning more is higher. So in conclusion, lower taxes equals more money in the long term and higher taxes equals less money. Additionally, because of this, it is always a good idea to tax the more luxury items in your market rather than the more basic items like grain because what we actually want to do, generally speaking, if you want to be benefiting the most from these taxation policies, is bring the low income pops up in income so we can get more money out of them. They cannot increase their standard of living if they're having to pay extra egregious taxes for things like grain or services. So taxes on luxury clothing, furniture, opium for instance, are a great way of generating revenue without punishing the low earners in your economy. Now, before I finish this, I do also want to mention national expenses. I have heard it said that if you decrease or increase your national expenses in terms of government wages, for example, that has little to no effect except changing the approval of a political group. As you can now see, that is categorically wrong. If you increase the government wages, you will increase the standard of living of all of those pops working for the government, meaning that, as I've said before, the amount that they are buying goes up, so the economy of your nation will grow. Reducing government wages and government spending contracts the economy of your nation because those pops become poorer and over a longer period of time, they will be able to buy less, meaning that they will not be contributing as much tax to the nation. So in fact, the healthiest nation you can manage is one on maximum military wages, government wages, and minimum taxation levels. Generally speaking, if you can get to these levels, you'll be operating with the fastest growing economy you can possibly get when we look at the economy in isolation and don't look at things like construction. If you'd like me to make a video covering how we can include construction on this, let me know down in the comments below because I will do so. If you've enjoyed this thrilling economic breakdown of taxation, and if you'd like to know how you can win wars in Victoria 3, even when you're outnumbered, possibly three, four, even 10 to one, Click the video on screen now.